Hi everyone, my name is Cameron Kasher. Um, I just first wanna, I guess in the spirit of Thanksgiving, since I am from the US, I'm from Denver, Colorado. Um, I wanna thank Max and Maria and everyone else who helped put this event together. It's been great so far, so I'm very grateful to be here. Um, so I'm a senior software engineer and I'd like to say responsible tech advocate at ThoughtWorks. Um, I am aware that my headshot is fairly out of date, <laughs> so I'll hopefully get a new one soon. Um, let's see. There we go. So I just wanted to begin the presentation with a bit of a thought-provoking quotation. So technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. So let this one marinate for a second. Personally, I think it's a great transition or segue into the idea of responsible tech, uh, highlighting the idea that we as technologists are responsible, whether the outcome is good, bad, or even an unintended consequence. So just last month, as I mentioned, ThoughtWorks and the United Nations created a responsible tech playbook together to guide the UN teams on their journey of adoption, and I'm delighted to share it here today. So starting with this excerpt from the um, introduction of the playbook to inspire others to consider their own responsible tech approach. So what is responsible tech? As you can see, it's simply a way of working, but the playbook contains information, tools, techniques that are relevant across all organizations. This one's pretty tailored for the UN, but really there's a lot of valuable material here for anybody. Um, it explores a responsible tech mindset and the tools and techniques that help teams identify strategies to be more inclusive, aware of bias, transparent, and to mitigate negative unintended consequences. Uh, I just wanted to touch on the playbook structure. So it's separated into three parts. Part one, um, pretty big recurring theme here today, awareness, um, awareness of responsible tech broadly and it's covering details on a few different topics. Uh, part two is action, which really focuses on the next steps for each topic, and then finally there's a resources section for each topic. Um, just briefly, to go over these topics, we've got data and AI, privacy, accessibility, diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, security, and lastly, what will bring focus here today, sustainability. Uh, just briefly, to give you an idea of how responsible tech plays into these topics, I could cover that, but for data and AI, for example, um, the emergence of generative AI tools makes it increasingly hard to distinguish between real and fake, combating misinformation, disinformation, in the age of big data and generative Generative AI has to be a priority for trusted organizations. Uh, privacy is a basic human right. Privacy is a key enabler for diversity and inclusion. Accessibility was originally intended to design products in places with a focus on people with disabilities. Now accessibility focuses on identifying exclusion and learning from diversity and extending solutions to all. And then we have DEI, and as, as technologists, by incorporating varied perspectives and lived experiences, we're better able to solve for the needs of our users. Security, pretty obvious one there. Protecting data, resources, and reputation is very important. And as organizations store, process, and share more insensitive information electronically, or sorry, electronically, Preventing breaches is very important. And finally, sustainability, which we'll go into here, just exploring areas of sustainable tech. And we'll do a deep dive on how to create tech that has a lower environmental impact in its lifetime. I just wanted to pull out this chart. Um, so in a recently published MIT technology review, Insights Survey, Opportunity for sustainability and ESG concerns were a common theme. As you can see here in this chart, sustainability and environmental impact is ranked among the top areas of focus for responsible technology. 
and it's becoming more apparent by the year that organizations are taking sustainability more and more seriously. So diving back into the playbook, um, I wanted to give you a glimpse of the introduction to sustainability. The key to this section is exploring the areas of sustainable tech with a deep dive on creating tech that has a lower environmental impact over its lifetime. And sustainability can be a loaded term, so we wanted to bring the focus down, as you can see in the diagram, to environmental sustainability, moreover the impact of technology on the environment. Now jumping ahead to the action section on sustainability, we introduced the concept of green ops, and you might be thinking another ops here to learn, but um, realistically, we pulled this term from the FinOps Foundation. So there's a concept of FinOps, and green ops has really been an emerging topic very closely tied. So there's a working group there that's really been focused on the sustainability considerations alongside FinOps and how they relate, but I just wanted to read out the definition here on this slide just so everyone has a base level understanding of what we consider green ops to be. So green ops is a cultural practice that enables organizations to consider and optimize for carbon and energy as key metrics for data-driven decisions in technology and operations. By adopting a green ops approach, Organizations can optimize not only their carbon footprint, but can also reduce costs, grow their capabilities, and sustain carbon-driven work. And this approach will consider carbon and energy as cross-functional requirements throughout the development process. And I'm gonna touch on the cycle here in the next slide, the green ops cycle, along with how we're applying green ops at ThoughtWorks. So this next phase is going to kind of touch in on a practical example of how we're applying this internally at my company. So I guess just to give an intro, I work for ThoughtWorks. We're a global tech consultancy. We actually have an office here in Berlin. I might check out tomorrow if I have time. Um, but really what we're doing is trying to bring sustainable driven work to our clients. So. As a team, we thought it's important to eat our own dog food, I guess you could say, and show that we're doing this ourselves. So diving into a practical example, the basis of our approach revolves around the green software fundamentals, the phases identified by the Green Software Foundation uh, of learn, measure, and reduce. And these phases include understanding the emissions drivers and their relationships to each other, measuring and accessing the right data, and implementing the necessary optimization strategies to reduce an organization's carbon footprint. So to make sense of emissions metrics and why certain cloud services might be more or less carbon intensive, it's important to have a fundamental understanding of green software principles, and also emissions drivers and really the broad domain of uh, sustainability in tech. So principles ranging from carbon efficiency to energy proportionality are essential for our platform engineers at ThoughtWorks to understand when looking to optimize their cloud infrastructure. So then after obtaining access to real-time data and enabling visualizations for monitoring, the natural next step is to more deeply analyze spikes and trends that ult and ultimately identify opportunities to implement strategies to mitigate emissions and also lower costs. And then finally, through sufficient analysis, our teams are able to consider ways to reduce their cloud carbon footprint um, and identify remediation strategies that would be most fitting for their objectives, requirements, and infrastructure needs. So here's where I'm able to give my plug, um, cloud carbon footprint, or CCF, CCF is an open source tool that helps you measure and analyze your carbon emissions and energy usage associated with the cloud. Um, so usually we have the big three like AWS, GCP, Azure, but it's extensible. You know, you can um, use this on some other cloud providers as well. And also we're looking to support on-prem. But it does this by tracking your energy and, and it uses emissions from your cloud resources. So considering Google Cloud, for example, um, 
you can grab resources such as Compute Engine instances, cloud storage buckets, or cloud SQL databases. Um, I'm going to get a little into the weeds here, just a little technical, so bear with me, but CCF integrates with a cloud service like Google Cloud by configuring the billing project to export billing and usage data to BigQuery, and then subsequently running queries on that data to filter for specific time frames and other relevant information. So some of the core logic in CCS, CCF has it map over usage data, examining each billing line item, and gathering information such as service name, usage or instance type, usage amount, usage unit, region, cost, etc. So based upon usage unit or instance type, CCF is able to identify and categorize the usage line item into separate categories, including compute, networking, storage, or memory. Anything that can't be categorized due to the lack of information gets grouped as unknown, which we have another working calculation to estimate. So then by parsing out the instance type information, CCF can understand the underlying hardware and grab average wattage information from publicly available data sources, allowing for an energy estimation based on the usage amount. And furthermore, by mapping the region to data sets like electricity maps, for example, that returns the carbon intensity of the grid where the data center is located. We can use that for a calculation to determine the estimated CO2E. So I'm proud to say I've been a maintainer of this open source software for a couple years now, and it's been a unique and rewarding experience of my career so far. Um, I suppose it's worth mentioning why we did it. Um, we launched CCF prior to a lot of these cloud providers launching their own carbon estimators. We'd like to think we helped push for that to happen. Um, and plainly, we just weren't getting this information from the cloud providers, though there was the demand to see it. Um, even with these tools coming out, like Google's Cloud Carbon Footprint, um, Microsoft Azure's, uh, we still see that there's a use for this. Um, there's a few reasons why. Um, all these cloud provider tools have you know, differing methodologies, and Cloud Carbon Footprint allows you to see these in a more apples-to-apples -apples sense, because we know that most technologists are actually using multi-cloud, so it's a bit easier for you to understand in similar terms. Uh, there's some other benefits like the granularity of the data since we're able to rely on average estimations. But on the other hand, there are a lot of valid reasons why you'd also want to use the cloud tools as well because a lot of that is coming directly from their energy source and electricity. So we like to think that they could be used together. So. I want to dive into this example a bit further and understand how we were able to use the CCF data and create meaningful insights. And we actually used several Google Cloud services to pipeline and visualize our carbon emissions data. These include App Engine, which I'm realizing is not on here, but uh, it's a fully managed platform that makes it easy to deploy and scale web applications. So we use App Engine to run our CCF application. We use Cloud Scheduler which is a cron-like service that allows you to schedule jobs to run on a recurring basis. And we use Cloud Scheduler to schedule a job to run every day at midnight. So this job triggers a pub sub message. And it's important to note that we like to do this every day. And you're able to backfill a lot of your historic usage data on the cloud. So with CCF, we offered a way to grab historic data as a background job. So the idea is you can get all that historic data and then implement this to then grab at a daily basis because as you can imagine, it is a lot of data. You might face scalability problems, but it, the idea is if you can configure this to be daily, um, you can create a functional system here. And then so we have PubSub, which is a messaging service that allows you to send and receive messages between applications on Google Cloud. And we use this to send the message from Cloud Scheduler to a cloud function. So a cloud function, which is a ser serverless platform that makes it easy to run code without having to provision or manage servers. 
and whose scale to zero feature mitigates costs as well. So we use cloud functions to automate the daily requests that are used to collect our carbon emissions data for Google Cloud, Amazon Web Services, and Microsoft Azure. We're able to connect to all three of those internally since ThoughtWorks uses all three. Um, next, we have BigQuery, which is a serverless, highly scalable data warehouse that makes it easy to store and analyze large amounts of data. Uh, we use BigQuery to store our carbon emissions data. And finally, we use Looker Studio, which is a business intelligence platform that makes it easy to create interactive dashboards and reports and where we can actually visualize our carbon emissions data. And just touching on scalability again, CCF actually offers out of the box like a front end dashboard you can use. Um, it's really easy to spin up a smaller application, especially if you're just using your own data. But when you get into using this at an organizational level, you might find you might want to imp implement the data with um, another business intelligence platform like Liquor Studio. So, just to recap this entire flow, we've got Cloud Scheduler tr triggering a pub sub message daily. The message is consumed by a cloud function that hits the CCF API with a query for one day's worth of data. And this function pushes the data upstream, appending it to a big query table. And that table is then consumed by Looker Studio and joined with the billing export table for many different visual visualizations. So you can visualize carbon and cost together. So now I want to give you an example of a chart that we actually saw doing this. So in the following chart, we can see three usage spikes and four emission spikes. And we can conclude at least two things from here. First, that the cost of the usage is not a perfect proxy for emissions. Uh, there's a big spike in emissions in early March, and there's no corresp corresponding rise in cost. So there are a number of reasons for this, including maybe the potential use of cloud savings plans or other billing cadences for reserved instances, perhaps. But second, we now know we should really drill in and understand why we have this emission spike and what exactly happened there in February and March. So we did do this, actually, which is how we were able to take steps to resolve. So here we have another chart with a different view that shows us emissions by cloud pro product over time, narrowing the scope to March 4th to March 12th, gives us this. And this is the time span covering that tallest point of our largest spike from the last chart. Um, we can see from the table below that the product contributing most of our emissions bulge is Cloud Composer by a significant margin. Looking a bit deeper, we learn that three Google Cloud projects are contributing over 90% of this spike. So with this information now in hand, we were able to reach out to the teams responsible for these projects in real time and commence tuning. So looking at the situation, four weeks later, we find a much narrower gap between Cloud Composer and Compute Engine. And estimated emissions from the use of Composer have been reduced substantially. Now, how did the teams achieve this? Well, it was a combination of right-sizing their environment size to reduce inefficiencies and lowering the auto-scaling configuration to use less workers, less allotted VCU, vCPU, um, memory and storage. And moving forward, there are a number of existing resources that not only cloud practitioners, but general technologists can use to help identify, um, to help identify proven patterns to achieve carbon optimization and reduction. So thinking back on the cycle that I introduced for green ops, learning, measuring, and reducing can be a recurring cycle for teams to stay knowledgeable and take action in real time. So just to recap on those, I want to just take note about how we were able to incorporate the green up cycle. So learn and understand, or essentially awareness, as we've been talking about. I wanted to call out the green software for, for practitioners course that's on the Linux Foundation website. Um, this is a great introductory, introductory course offered by the GSF as well to help get a base level understanding of um, green software fundamentals, principles, 
and great for practitioners or really anyone at any level to learn more about this. <coughs> also, I just wanted to call out a recent prediction laid out by Google that by 2025, three out of four developers will lead with sustainability as their primary development principle. So in ThoughtWorks, we tried to create an initiative to inform a lot of our practitioners to take this exam. So we've been promoting it, trying to get the numbers up to do it. Um, you do get a certification. I think you can link it to your uh, LinkedIn profile. So it's a pretty cool thing. Would highly recommend. Moving on to measure and analyze. Um, I talked about CCF. That's a measuring tool that obviously I would propose as a maintainer, but there's also a lot of other great tools. Um, Lucas mentioned a lot of them in the W3C list. Um, you'll find CCF on there, I believe, but there's so many awesome tools there, so that's a good resource. Um, I want to call out the SEI standard from the Green Software Foundation. Um, currently, honestly, with the help of Chris, we're trying to consider ways to make CCF compatible with the SEI to create a software carbon intensity score. So happy to talk more about that if anyone's interested. And then finally, the optimize and reduce section. Um, as part of the green software fun fundamentals, the GC GSF published a patterns catalog which lays out specific examples of how to apply one or more green software principles in a real world example and in order to help determine the right approach for imp implementing optimization or remediation strategies, the FinOps Foundation is preparing a categorized list of sustainability awareness in indicative questions or a self-assessment. So I link to it here, happy to share that out as well, but these questions are meant to help organizations begin to assess both where they are and where they would like to aim to be on their path towards a sustainable transformation. Uh, finally, jumping back to the playbook, uh, that third part I mentioned about resources, this is what we threw together. Honestly, there's so much more we could add to this, but we have a valuable list of resources, including tools like the various cloud service provider, carbon tools, uh, general resources where you can see I've added things like the W3C list. Uh, we have references like the State of Green Software Report, and finally methodologies where I've included CCFs along with some others. Um, you can see the Green Software Patterns catalog is on there, which gives a comprehensive list of patterns for practitioners. Um, one thing that I actually didn't include on the slide deck I wanted to call out, and it's kind of also been a common theme today, just challenges we faced internally with our practical example. Um, one thing, it was a little tough at ThoughtWorks, we had to sort of have a grassroots initiative, which I've heard some other panelists too, to get this going. Um, so a, a lot of this work we had to spend our free time doing to prove out why it's important. And really to even get to a point where you can get these dashboards up, start analyzing these metrics, it's really important to have an internal stakeholder or an advocate at the company from the top down to help push this sort of work along. So luckily we were able to do that. Um, there's a lot of other ways we could take the data we have. I showed you an example of the visualization and how we were able to tweak it and find the teams responsible, but really you could do a number of things. You could make automating reports. You could set up maybe like a carbon alert. So if it goes over a certain threshold, you'll know you need to take action. Um, there's possibility for gamification there. You can view from an organization level how different account teams um, sort of pair up to each other and see if one team could be doing more or less work. So really there's a lot of places to take it and it's kind of an exciting idea of where that could go. Uh, finally, I just want to loop back in this responsible tech mindset idea. Um, I'm happy that I got to include sustainability on that list for the playbook, but as I mentioned earlier, there's plenty of other topics. Um, I know that we're focused on sustainability here, but being a responsible technologist includes you know, many things like, I wanted to just give you the summary of what to remember to start developing 
the responsible tech mindset. So just to call out here, um, you may have already faced technical issues that have affected you, so use that experience. Don't jump to a technical solution. Ask yourself about blind spots, think beyond the problem. Um, use empathy, put yourself in other people's shoes. Document yourself and your approach for responsible tech tooling, which is included in the playbook. A lot of useful tools for teams. And just know that it's a recurring process. It's not like a one and done thing. So thank you. Um, I have a link to the playbook here. So if anyone wants to download that for themselves and just refer to it, I think it's a really awesome piece of work and everyone could reference it. Um, but thanks again. And we have time for questions. Thank you, Cameron. Yeah. So, um, any questions? There. I'm going to share my mic, I guess. Thank you. I have a question which is kind of at the beginning where you say, uh, talk about the <coughs> topics for responsible tech. And I was a bit confused to see sustainability being apart from all the other stuff, because from my perspective, all the other topics were part of social sustainability. And so it's also sustainability, but it's the social part. So, so why was that decision made that the one thing that's on focusing on the environment is called sustainability and the other stuff is not? It's a great question. So I was able to help out sort of leading on that chapter. Um, I can give you insight into how we went about those topics. There were a long series of interviews with our stakeholder, which was the UN, um, understanding what topics would be most beneficial for their teams. Um, we did hear this topic of social sustainability come up a number of times, as you might know, like the sustainable development goals are more oriented around social sustainability. Um, we also found through surveys and interviews that environmental was very important. So during the one slide I mentioned how we take sustainability and sort of scope it down to focus on environmental sustainability. That was our goal to really be able to focus on green ops and use the personas that we determined how each part of a team could consider environmental sustainability. So we really didn't touch so much on social sustainability for this playbook. That said, there's a lot to really consider there. But just from my own experience and what our team decided would be most beneficial, we chose to focus on environmental. Hopefully that answers. Thank you, Yuta, for the question. And now one of our own has a question for you. Hi. Um, I, I was just curious to know, uh, at the beginning you were trying to uh, dissect green tech and uh, see what, yeah, what it's made of, and I was just curious about the distinction between clean tech and environmental tech. So what the yeah. difference there uh, would be. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so that decision was to further narrow the scope down to you know, what we ended up talking about in our awareness and action section. So um, we found through you know our own research and articles and things that there are a lot of terms out there for sustainable tech. You see green tech, clean tech, climate tech, like a lot of these tend to be used interchangeably. Um, honestly, I think some of it could be a preference, but we wanted to just differentiate that climate tech might be more focused on tech that's committed to solving the climate problem, like um, carbon accounting platforms or things that can really help with uh, global warming. Um, clean tech might be more topics considering renewable energy, so focused on applications where you can maybe, you know, use the Electricity Maps API like I mentioned and find out where you can use renewable resources from different areas of the grid. So we wanted to just make that distinction there. But um, yeah, I think that's a great question because there is a lot, of, there are a lot of words and buzzwords out there, so just sort of having to have a good understanding of what means what is important. So that's kind of what we tried to do in that awareness section. 
Thanks for the great question, Danny. And I'm confused. Chola, in every, every slot you're asking questions more and more and more. And now, <laughs> the closer we come to your presentation or your panel, you're getting more silent. Okay. No, no, no. There, there are others. Okay. Uh, you. I saw you first. Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, I probably won't be here if, I, if your CCF didn't, uh, didn't roll out, so uh, thanks for that. And as you mentioned, <laughs> yeah. it did kickstart something within our company to start analyzing and uh, start to, to look into how we, can, uh, uh, how we can see what carbon uh, density our applications have. I was interested, are there any similar projects coming up that is going to maybe any similar projects coming up that is going to maybe help other companies to further analyze them into analyzing their carbon carbon footprint or uh, there are other IT systems? Is there anything else cool coming up that we should know about? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Um, so at ThoughtWorks, our focus has been mainly around this tool. Um, maintaining it could be a full-time job, honestly. Um, it's really unique work being a technologist to be a maintainer. Um, you're constantly looking at rising issues, pull request discussions, um, doing all the maintenance involved as well as feature development and just continuing a roadmap. So there's a lot of that focus specifically on CCF. Um, even on the maintenance side, I think we have some open <coughs> issues just to update some of our dependencies like um, the way you connect to Microsoft Azure. You're connected using the consumption management API and I think our approach is going to be deprecated soon so we need to spend some time updating that but that's just CCF. I'll say other work on the horizon. I would defer to what's going on in the Green Software Foundation. There's a lot of amazing projects going on in the open source working group. Um, the community working group is doing really cool things to engage in the community obviously. Um, Chris's Green Web Foundation has a lot of awesome stuff going on there. So again, I would also defer to Lucas's list of just resources to help give you an idea of where to look and where to keep reading and finding cool things going on. Thank you. This is actually what we want to achieve here in this conference, to have dialogues like this. I have more questions over here somewhere there. I see you, I see you, you're next, but here. First of all, thank you very much for your talk and for all the work that you do with the CCF. And I have a question particular regarding the CCF. Um, do you have any kind of success stories or examples uh, where you can actually put numbers on the overhead that CCF introduces? Because that has to have a footprint of its own, right? Um, and I'm wondering if you can already um, provide information or any kind of stories regarding how the net outcome was of introducing CCF into uh, projects uh, and, and having all of this monitoring set up done. Um, yeah, how, how much did you spend? Uh, how much did you have to spend and how much do you get out of it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, honestly, full transparency, I'll let you know that Again, I'm from the US. Um, I work for a consultancy. So it's been interesting to find a way to sell this work. So, you know, for our company to have the internal investment for me and my team to work on this, there obviously needs to be a value there. So, um, how do you sell open source software? You really don't, but what we've been trying to do is sell its implementation. And Honestly, it's been difficult to do that in the US um, for a number of reasons. I think we get back into the topic of regulation. It's a bit behind over there what's going on over here. So it's been tough for any of our clients or organizations to really prioritize this work. So on that note, we don't really have a great use case of this work, how CCF actually includes its own carbon footprint um, we do have teams doing what we call green software research of our own. So it, I think it would be really interesting to understand that. Um, I think it would take some time to really filter out 
that at that resource level, like what's being attributed from CCF on CCF when you're reading it. Um, I think for that reason, and also another cool thing about the tool is that you can get that granular. Um, you can utilize tagging in the cloud. So you could go in and tag your resources that are affiliated with running CCF, and then later use CCF to filter by that tag and understand its impact. So honestly, I don't have a great answer for you, but I think it would be very interesting to learn that. Maybe you two can catch up later too. Yeah. And also we have a question over here. Here you go. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, you just kind of covered my question, but um, it was also in regards to uh, what well, we talked about uh, grassroots movement within the organization as a first step and then a second step, but getting management buy-in. Uh, and then maybe a third step, um, you know, spreading the word. Um, amongst clients, um, customers, and so forth. Uh, could you just kind of give some more examples? How did you go from that first step to the second step, for example? And um, any ideas for expanding the third step, getting customers more aware of that? Thanks. Yeah. So I joined our team working on this a couple years ago. Um, as I mentioned, yeah, it was a bit of a grassroots situation. Um, our company was willing to allocate sort of like a sustainability lead and this was her focus to choose to create this lead based off um, you know industry research about what clients might want so that's sort of how we landed on the cloud carbon footprint um, my company has a history of developing open source tooling so it kind of made sense to explore that so the actual sell was a bit before my time to get that team situated, but personally, when I found out that was happening, I made a point to get on and involved. Um, so fast forwarding to actually doing it and doing this, creating this use case. Um, the idea is that our company as a consultancy is focused on selling this work, but we have to prove we can do this ourselves. So um, we needed to sort of put this together almost the same way I presented it to you, where we show a story of how we used the data, found spikes through monitoring, and made steps to resolve it. Sort of put that together and almost pitch internally to the leaders in our company and explain why this is important. Um, usually when you're talking at that level, you need to have metrics, like understanding percentages saved. Um, another reason why we are tying FinOps so closely to this green ops term is that um, a lot of organizations may prioritize this less, but if you can really combine that in terms of cost savings, then, you know, then you're piquing some interest there of some of, you know, the CFO or something. So really understanding how this can also help potentially reduce costs is important. Um, but again, really finding someone in your organization to help drive this work and help drive the conversations is really important. And luckily, we were able to do that with our sort of organizational layout at ThoughtWorks. It was a bit easier to do that. Um, next steps for us, as I kind of mentioned, looking into doing recurring reports, um, letting teams sort of filter by their own accounts. You can see organizationally what it looks like, but also see exactly what your team is doing. Um, and yeah, maybe even potentially setting up alerts similar to cost alerts that you might see, but more oriented for carbon. But yeah, great question. Thank you for the questions. And now, last but not least, I would like to ask a question myself. Um, Actually, you, oh, no, my voice is loud. No, it's silent again. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, you said you are proud of maintaining open source uh, software, right? So what is your experience with maintaining open source software? I think there will be some complicated situations there. And yeah. yeah. What can you tell us about this? Um, well, I mentioned that I consider it a highlight of my career so far. I think it's been a very unique experience. Um, uh, obviously, it's afforded me opportunities like this to come here and talk about it and be able to meet some really awesome people here. Um, 
honestly, hearing any time, as you mentioned, um, adopters is really awesome, just to hear that this is having an impact. Um, the cool thing about CCF is the fact that it's open. So um, not only do we get to use industry experts to help validate our methodology and calculations, but also we get to you know, hear back from the community and the demand out there to understand what could be most important for the application roadmap itself. So CCF is very demand driven by the community to understand what we should focus on. And yeah, just having the opportunity to communicate and meet some of the people, put a face to the names of these contributors that I'm seeing on GitHub is a surreal experience. Um, but yeah, I, thought, I think it's been great being a maintainer. It's been really cool. So you would recommend this to yeah. work in this field? <laughs> if you have the time outside of the normal nine to five, then <laughs> yeah. Or if your company oh. would sponsor you to do it. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for answering all our questions here and for coming all the way from the US. Cameron, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.